לכולכם, וכעת אנחנו נפנה את הבמה כדי להציג בפניכם את ראש הממשלה לשעבר, מר בנימין נתניהו. We heard uh, during this day about the difficult problems that Israel has to cope with in the international arena, both in the uh, legislative body and universal uh, jurisdiction. And the question that we're asking ourselves is how should the State of Israel behave in view of the tsunami of a delegitimization that we have to cope with in the media, in the academic world and obviously in the UN bodies. So to end this conference, we invited the former Prime Minister and the head of the opposition, Mr. Benjamin Netanyahu, to give us his point of view regarding what should be the policy of the State of Israel in view of these circumstances. Thank you very much, uh, Dori Gold, and thank you. We are now facing three arenas, the security one, the political one, and it's, uh, annex, which is the um, Hasbara, what we call information, and we are attacked in all three. As for the defense and the security, I'd like to clarify here and now what we've been saying for quite some time, and that is that no one can be the, the subcontractor of our defense. The idea that we can hand our security to the Palestinian Authority and that they will protect us has failed. Has failed uh, in Gaza when uh, we did the unilateral disengagement and we got the Hamas, and it's going to fail here in Judea and Samaria as well if we repeat the same mistake. Abu Mazen, unfortunately, cannot. I'm not going into whether he wants, but he cannot be a solution to our security problems. And if we are going to go out, it's not that he's going to protect us. It's that we, if we stay there, we protect ourselves. And in that opportunity, we protect him as well. The idea that we will hand over weapons to the Palestinian Authority in its situation today to give them uh, weapons, to give them uh, armored uh, cars. Today, we thought also of the Kalachnikov uh, guns and uh, other weapons. The idea that this uh, weaponry is going to protect us is uh, this idea is, is it's not just uh, erroneous, it's just stupid because exactly the opposite is going to happen. This uh, weapon is going to go against us, the IDF soldiers, sooner than we think. Same happened in uh, the Gaza Strip, that uh, weapons that was at the hands of the Hamas, uh, some of it, not all of it, but some of it was uh, weapons that they got from our own warehouses. We have to make sure that this doesn't happen. And therefore, the government is making a mistake by the fact that it enables the transfer of armored cars and guns to the Palestinian Authority because they will not be able to protect us. And as opposed to that, this weapon is going to fall into the hands of our enemies, the Hamas and others, and they're going to use it against us. This is a mistake. Our security problems and the, uh, the constrained uh, efforts to amend them is a result of political mistakes, mistakes of uh, political uh, evaluation and uh, political, uh, the assumption that uh, guided some of the Israeli governments as the present one is that through a process of uh, disengagements, we will going to get two things. We will get legitimacy and we will get security. As for legitimacy, I'm going to touch upon that when we talk about uh, the uh, uh, information arena, which is inter alia, the issue at hand. You're talking about it, the legal rights and uh, the uh, universal authority and the public opinion in the world. But first of all, we have to understand 
that the basic assumption was that we will get legitimacy as well as security. What happened was that uh, the unilateral uh, withdrawal from Lebanon created an Iranian basis in the south of Lebanon, and the uh, unilateral disengagement from Gaza created an Iranian base in the south. Yesterday, Mubarak, he was quoted in one of our newspapers. He said that Egypt today has a border with Iran because of the establishment of that Hamas entity in the Gaza Strip. And I must say, that uh, whether he said it or not, I agree with him. We all have an Iranian border today because Iran has a basis south of Ashkelon, not far from Ashdod, very close to the Western Negev. In other words, uh, the unilateral disengagements brought about, without the uh, connection to the intention, they brought about the creation of an Iranian base in the south of the country and in the north of the country. And in each of these bases, some 4,000 rockets were launched at us, 4,000 from the north to the Galilee and 4,000 rockets that are still being uh, launched even today, uh, including today is from the Hamastan, as we, uh, I actually coined this phrase at the time, the Hamastan. They are launched towards uh, Israel, the Negev settlements, uh, the western Negev, Ashkelon, and hope, probably further on. You have to understand also that there's an armament, especially in the encouragement of Iran, into these two places. We're talking about Lebanon, about uh, the armament of uh, between 30 to 40,000 rockets, which is a much larger scope than what they had uh, before the war, not just in quantities, but also in quality. Although there are all sorts of international arrangements and uh, guarantees and uh, whatever, but that doesn't help us. The same thing happens in the Gaza Strip, although there was a consensus in international support with regard to the Gaza Strip. We know very well in the unilateral disengagement, as it, it is called, we see also great empowerment and great influx of weaponry. And therefore, we have those uh, two problems that are very critical to Israel's security. I can tell you that it is not certain that given the level of armament of Hezbollah, uh, there is a state within a state. I would say that a government uh, a state it begins to be a state within a state. This is a situation, a reversal of the situation. In other words, this policy was wrong, it was erroneous, and it's conducive to the uh, security problems that are not being solved very well. And there are things we need to do with regard to those threats what we need not to do is to create another basis, a third Iranian basis in the heart of the country and in Jerusalem. Right now, the current uh, policy of the government de facto, in fact, promotes this reality. The underlying assumption is that if we pull out, if we withdraw, the uh, situation will stabilize. If we give armored vehicles and more rifles and we give it to the Palestinian Authority, somehow they will be able to cope with this situation. They will not be able to cope with it for even one minute, and the same will happen as was the case in the Gaza Strip. Therefore, we do not uh, champion this approach, we believe that by and large, according to the government, Weltanschauung, there are two alternatives uh, to make the same mistake. And with the same results, but more so, and with a much greater threat to uh, the threat that we have experienced to date, Einstein once said that if you make a mistake once, it's human. If you make the same mistake again, the same mistake, it's stupid. And if you make it the third time, well, you had a very special definition. Uh, we uh, we want to make the third mist the mistake for the third time simply uh, to bash our head against the wall and it breaks. And the second thing to do is not to do anything. I rule out the first one and I rule out the second option. And the third option, however, which I do support, is one of promoting an economic peace with the Palestinian Authority here in Judea and Samira in a bid to create a corridor for a future diplomatic arrangement. We are not there because we don't have a partner, and we don't have a partner because the Palestinian society, including the one in Judea and Samaria, is biased toward the Hamas. It is biased toward the Hamas because there is no positive alternative. There is no economic development, and there is no hope uh, for the uh, individual's life, given the current setting. And the, uh, the question is how to create this hope. Uh, the government says that we create this hope if we pull out and Hamas will take over the entire area. And I'm saying the only way to create this hope is to create rapid economic development 
they would be conducive to capabilities. I would also say economic uh, reward to the Palestinians and also would create a climate which actually reduces uh, the attraction of the radical elements in Palestinian society, the radical Muslim. By rampant economic development, we can actually reduce the mobilization uh, uh, cloud of the Palestinian organization. There, we, there would be no core of the militants which are brainwashed, but perhaps if we explained them to others. In other words, we champion three moves. The first one is to keep security on our hands that are already said not to give it to any subcontractor. There are no subcontractors to Israel's security. We do not give security to anybody else. We keep security. We do not arm the Palestinian Authority. We make sure that security remains within the IDF, between the Shin Bet and all the other security bodies. That's the first thing. The second thing is to promote economic peace by focusing on a number of def definitive projects on the same line between us and the Palestinians in Judea and Samaria. And this is possible, this is viable. Uh, tourist, industrial, and agricultural projects that we are identifying, and we are certainly uh, can and, w and should develop rapidly in order to have some kind of a, uh, economic benefit. Uh, but this is not a replacement for diplomatic negotiations. However, it can create a climate that would bring about attenuation of radicalism and uh, would promote a diplomatic solution. We saw that in Ireland and to a great extent in Cyprus. In areas that seems that uh, problems are not solvable, they are solved by having economic development. The third one is to have regional cooperation. Jordan and I'm talking about economic cooperation and other things. This is a very real program. It would change reality in a way whereby our security is not handed over would not put in danger, but on the other hand, it changes reality for the Palestinians in a positive and regulated manner. However, uh, if there is a Palestinian leadership one day that recognizes the state of the Jewish people to have its own state that is willing to fight terrorism and stop incitement, obviously we will negotiate with it and we would have a diplomatic negotiations. However, this is not a reality today. And by giving Kalashnikovs and armored vehicles is no solution by all means. And this is like burying your head in the sand. The reality is, is you can change it in a regulated fashion the way I've suggested by having economic peace where we keep security. So those are the measures that I think are very vital as far as security and diplomacy. And we are under a major attack of the radical Islam. And the threats that we are seeing today are the proxies of the Iranians. The big Iranian threat is on the east, and this is what should be neutralized. However, this threat is complex or made up like all other threats that we've just cited, not only about a physical attack, not only the diplomatic and political uh, field, but chief and foremost, it is predicated on a moral attack an attack that tries to negate our right to self-defense. And I think here, too, uh, there is a vacuum and a, um, a blunder, if you will. I think those attacks all have a double-edged sword. On the one hand, they reinforce our enemies. They give our enemies the basis to argue that they are right and that we represent injustice that should be rectified by our weakening, by attacking us. On the other hand, they weaken us because our ability to defend ourselves against those attacks is greatly reduced when we are, do, we are not equipped or aren't with the justification and that we're not confident about our own position, that the Jewish people fights for its existence from a moral and a legal point of view. And therefore, it is important to understand that there was a great reversal here, because if we go 100 years back in time or 90 years back in time uh, to the end of the First World War, and even before that, uh, during the Versailles Convention, there was no, there was no question uh, to the world leaders who were very enlightened people, very well-read, hopefully 
to that era. So they knew the history of the Middle East very well, and they knew very well the history of the Jewish people and the land of Israel. And therefore, they formulated this understanding of the historic rights, inalienable rights of the Jewish people, and they formulated uh, with the Balfour Declaration that was later solidified our right for a nation state, a Jewish nation state was solidified twice by the most two important bodies of the 20th century. First of all, the League of Nations that in fact adopted the Balfour Declaration and then the UN resolutions that in fact recognized and called upon the limitation of the rights of the Jewish people to have its own sovereign state. What was clear 100 years ago or 60 years ago is today uh, sub sub subjected to incessant attacks uh, because the attacks on us is not with regard to this or that clause or this point or this area or the, or the other or the territories, quote unquote, but in fact there is some kind of an onslaught on uh, the right of the Jewish people to have its own sovereign state in any part of the land of Israel and Eretz Israel. And this attack does not subside. In fact, it actually is amplified. It does not attenuate with our withdrawal from territories, which is a question unto itself. We need to cope with this question with regard to security questions and the questions of partners and reciprocity and others, and I'm not going to go into the discussion. However, what I want to say, the thesis that existed that if we withdraw and to the 67 borders, those attacks would reduce, but in the test of reality, this is not this has not happened. The opposite has happened in the test of reality. In fact, a, short, a few months after the implementation of the Oslo Agreement, there was some kind of a decline in terrorism. But three months later, the, the same attacks started, both in the Security Council and also in the resolutions of the UN plenary. Unfortunately, this also happened after the unilateral disengagement from the Gaza, Gaza Strip, where we should have received unlimited legitimacy to defend ourselves and fend off attacks uh, from the Gaza Strip, and the exact opposite has ha happened. In fact, we see that the Security Council it criticizes Israel, and the international bodies criticize Israel and try to put all kinds of constraints on our ability to defend ourselves with marginal or non-existent or negligible a reference to the fact that our towns are being attacked, that our children, are, are, our people are being attacked. And therefore, the assumption that those withdrawals uh, would give us not physical security, at least international legitimacy, uh, are not implemented, even for the reasons that I cited, but also the very simple reason that the very legitimacy of our existence in any area is being uh, challenged and being defied. And I think this is made possible because of ignorance, mainly because of ignorance, and the willingness to relinquish the arena to this uh, ignorance when you're not equipped with the data, you don't know what to respond to these attacks. And I would say the problem is not only with the nations of the world, but also amongst ourselves. If people do not know the historic background and the judicial rights of the Jewish people led to the historical rights and do not understand the ongoing international recognition, then they are always on the defense and without the ability to defend and to fight back. And as a result of which, they some kind of anchor a certain concept. There's no need to have a war of information of Hasmara. It doesn't even happen. The only thing that helps is war itself. But this is a war is tossed by the fact that there is no justification that actually limits the war for a limited time. But your room for maneuverability increases immeasurably if you can bring the nations of the world to understand that you are in their right and that you are not operating from a position which is not judicially or morally founded. And therefore, it seems to me that the Hasbara campaign to explain our national rights and our legal rights is a vital struggle and necessary that is done with a concerted effort on the diplomatic and security fronts. Actually, I would say that there's a chain 
of uh, reciprocal relations in this chain was actually created in the modern world. In the world of uh, mass communication, actually we have the pattern in the 20th century that you cannot protect military achievements without protecting them accompanied by political achievements. And you cannot protect political achievements if you cannot protect it in the public opinion. And you cannot protect your position in public opinion if the other side presents you as unjust, whereas it is just. Therefore, the capability to argue the argument of justice is necessary and vital to any side, but uh, definitely when you are right and uh, you don't bring about uh, this uh, weaponry, then this is really perhaps uh, the most uh, difficult problem with this uh, lightness of us uh, adopting uh, the arguments of our enemies because of that ignorance. For example, occupied territories. Occupied territories, this is a term uh, they say that uh, that uh, one uh, picture is worth a thousand uh, words. Uh, sometimes one word is uh, worth a thousand pictures. Uh, the, uh, the victory of priority. This is controversial, uh, disputed territories. What is the significance of a 242? You know that very, very, very well. What was said there? What wasn't said there? What are the rights of Israel? These things are completely deleted, erased. Uh, they swallowed. Nobody uh, responds. Almost the representatives of Israel say, oh, there's no point to wage war back. I think the opposite is uh, true. We have to struggle in the Hasbara information uh, arena regarding our legal rights uh, and the uh, international history. We have Yuda Bloom here. He's one of the great experts on that, and he did a lot uh, in this issue. And at the moment uh, that we neglect this arena, we go into this uh, opposite chain, because we cannot protect the justice of our position, we are then defeated in the public opinion. And we're defeated in the public opinion, we get uh, an uh, unproportional political pressure. And we do that. Sometimes it can annul, it can do away with uh, the power that we have in the military arena. That's why we have to act in all these arenas as one, not to beautify things and not to change things, not to uh, sweep under the carpet, but to talk about facts as they are, even uh, the historical facts and the legal ones, and naturally to see reality as it is. Uh, the basis of policy is to see reality as it is. You can change reality out of reality, not out of uh, some uh, ambitions and or not by distorting uh, the uh, reality according to the dictations of our enemies. I think this is the mission that is happening these days, and it doesn't become less. It just becomes more urgent. I thank you. We do have time for a couple of questions. You know, when there are no questions, everything is well and good. He does have to ask it into the microphone, cannot hear. Mr. Netanyahu, it seems that today the state of Israel is going towards a ceasefire in inverted commas uh, by the support uh, of uh, the United States. And can you help us understand the dangers and how to think about the uh, growing problem, the most difficult problem of the armament of Hamas uh, in Gaza, and what can Israel do about it? I don't think that there's anybody who wants to renew the fire, but on the other hand, we do not want that within the Gaza Strip, the Hamas will continue to arm itself uh, freely. And also the question of uh, the seam line and closing it between Gaza and Sinai, uh, what we call the Philadelphia Axis, this layer is a basic layer in any change of the situation, because at the moment the flow is continuing and the armament continues. And that's why the critical question is whether Israel prevents with various means 
uh, whether through the help of uh, Egypt or the government or both, the continuation of the armament of Hamas, because unless it prevents it, then the ceasefire is just going to be uh, the stopping of armament towards the next round. And that's why this is the question we have to ask ourselves. And by the way, at a time when Sharon raised the issue of the disengagement, and I had a lot of arguments with him, I said, one thing, don't, don't desert, don't neglect. I told him to do something else altogether, but I said, this component of the Philadelphia axis or the closure uh, in, on the south, uh, quote unquote, the southwest of the strip has to continue no matter what. And in practice, it doesn't happen, and this is the question that's important. Please, can you relate to the call of the Saudi king yesterday that he wants to hold a dialogue with the other religions, and he called us our brethren, the Torah, children and, of course, uh, the sons of the New Testament. We heard uh, the position of a religious person in Israel. What's your position? I must say I didn't hear this call, but it sounds interesting. I cannot relate to it because I didn't read the details, but I can say one thing. The problem that we have in the world is uh, not with other religions. It's with the uh, sects within those religions that uh, want to annul uh, the uh, freedom of choice, the religious freedom of choice, and not just the religious one, of the people who do not uh, champion the same doctrine of this sect. Today, the greatest threat on humanity comes from this sect, the fundamentalistic uh, sect uh, in Islam, and they uh, threaten the other Muslims and, of course, they uh, target Israel, and it's not just the Eastern world. It, it threatens a lot uh, of uh, countries in the world. And I think that the Arab countries, majority of them, almost with no exceptions, the Arab regimes understand this danger. But the question is, what do they do about it? And the answer is that these regimes do very little. They talk in uh, all sorts of discreet uh, diplomatic meetings. First of all, they hope that uh, the United States will do something that will uh, neutralize uh, the uh, Iranian uh, nuclear uh, power. But on the other hand, they stand aside and ask themselves, what happens if the United States doesn't do it? And they, they start organizing for themselves all sorts of other options of uh, various arrangements with Iran, maybe to be the bankers of Iran, maybe to be the Hong Kong of Iran, uh, quote-unquote, and other arrangements. That's why I don't see, unfortunately, any stabilization uh, as a rigid one in the Arab world against Iran, despite of the fact that the Iranian danger is uh, clear to all these regimes. But anyway, I will relate to this call of the King of Saudi, Saudi Arabia that you thought after I read it, and then I'll be able to react. And the last uh, question. When I look at uh, China and the Gulf countries, I see that there's a connection between economic power and the political power in the international arena. I wanted to know if you have anything to say about it. Well, there's no question that uh, economic power is a basis for political and military power. That's uh, obvious. It's always been so in history, but it is becoming more and more true in the world of uh, the huge economic changes that are happening uh, every day. As for Israel, its capability to fund uh, our security needs that have been changed in, or will be changed in the last, next few years, these new threats, this capability is conditioned on an accelerated economic growth. There's no factor in the world, including the United States, that will cover all the expenses or even the main bulk of expenses in security because the additional uh, expenses that we will have to pay in the new world, the Israeli security needs vis-a-vis -vis the threats of the 
conventional and extreme uh, factors in the Islam are going to grow, and that's why the economy has to grow as well. Our way to fund our security needs is through an accelerated economic growth. There's no other way to do it, for example. The uh, first Lebanon war was funded by uh, tax ex taxes, special taxes, uh, special uh, levy uh, tax that uh, put more taxes another burden on the citizens of Israel who were taxed already very highly, whereas the last war and the security fence and all the expenses of the disengagements altogether, we're talking about 30 billion shekel, all that was funded not by addition of tax, by reducing tax and increasing the competitiveness. Uh, it was funded by the growth. And that's why the security needs, and I would add that the social ones, the educational, Zionistic one, as far as Aliyah absorption, again, to become an attraction for the Olim, all this has to do with our economic growth, the capability. That's one uh, part of the equation. The other part is that we easily can renew the policy of accelerated growth, and I think that this is totally in our hands. I'm aware of the fact that we are in a situation of uh, fluctuations and all sorts of economic storms at the moment. I don't mean to tell you how long it's going to take until the international uh, economic world is going to stabilize, but I can say, first of all, that I support the efforts of the governor of the Israel Bank, Stanley Fisher, to stabilize the uh, rate of exchange with the monetary instruments that he has. But on the other hand, you have to understand that there's a whole field of activities that we can engage in in order to uh, move the economy forward and to alleviate the problems of the Israeli manufacturers, the exporters, the industrialists, because the component of the rate of exchange is only one in the equation, but you can change the uh, Israeli companies and make them more effective, more competitive by reducing taxes as well as uh, renewing the reforms that actually were implemented in the last two years, reforms that uh, open all the bureaucratic uh, barriers and uh, make the expenses less expensive and creating uh, services and products in Israel. Namely, the government here has to intervene. It's not just the governor. I think that the government also has to be active to go from a passive kind of policy of uh, accepting the fall of uh, the rate of the growth of our economy to an active policy of renewing the growth in a pace of 5 6% and above. Actually, we were uh, more than 6% before the Lebanon war, and the government takes it as self-evident that we're going to go to half, 3 3.5%. Three I'm saying it's exactly the opposite that should happen. We should go from a passive kind of political uh, stand to the encouragement of growth by reducing tax and by renewing the whole reforms that were created in the last few years. That's going to give us the economic power to come out strengthened from this crisis in a much better position in the world markets because we're going to do things that the other countries don't. That's why we're stronger now than the other countries because it's exactly what we did. You have to continue with this policy or to renew it. And that's going to give us a lot of power, a lot of advantage, both in the uh, defense arena, the social arena, because today this sound economy gives the answer. I really thank you. Thank you very much. I'd like to thank the head of the opposition, the former Prime Minister, Benjamin Netanyahu, who uh, closed our event today. I just would like to add two sentences. We actually saw two things during this day. One is that we have a difficult problem with international attacks on Israel in various arenas. And the second thing, that we are just. The just justice is with us. And uh, perhaps this conference can uh, be a jumping board towards the continuation of the legal activity 
and political activity through the Jerusalem Center and the new legal project, then we can contribute towards the struggle of Israel. I also would like to thank all the staff, all the people in the Jerusalem Center and uh, the uh, State Commission, all the people who worked so hard. And again, Lars Hansel, I want to thank you for your very important contribution of the uh, Konrad Adenauer Stiftung. And of course, this entire conference was a joint planning, and we really appreciate your contribution. Thank you, and good evening.